There's a quote which says, to be a spy, you need to be the man of integrity. However, you need to be prepared to be a criminal. Over the decades, the Cold War was fought between the East and the West. Unfortunately for many who believe that this war it's ended in 1989, they're mistaken. Goes without question, without doubt on my mind that most aspect of intelligence, it is the human intelligence, which is requiring human to human interaction. Today we have a technical, mechanical, satellite, geospatial, and all these different disciplines of collecting information for intelligence purposes. However, the most important element it is, was, and it will be, it is the human intelligence, interaction from man to man. And why is that important? You see, you can put as much as you want the passwords on your files. You can do lock in a safe. You can put a concrete, tons and tons of concrete on your laptop to hide the, your laptop. But one thing you're never gonna be able to protect, and that is the human brain, which is the most sophisticated computer. And humans requiring interaction with other humans, social engineering, it's a one of the most profound ways human intelligence applied and utilized in collecting intelligence. And today we're going to talk about a gentleman called Misha. Better know the man without face. The man who drove the Western society, Western world, and Western intelligence agencies insane. How good that man it is. Welcome to Podcast Live to Butterfield. My name is Mario Beckes. And today I'm going to analyze for you how successful can be intelligence agency without all these technical gadgets, with all these mechanical means, just applying simple human factor, which is social engineering. The question I do have for you, have you ever wondered why Western intelligence agencies never took advantage of the fact that the Warsaw Pact countries collapsed like a house of cards? and the CIA, MI6, and others suddenly had access to thousands of intelligence agents who made their lives miserable through the Cold War. Perhaps the reason is because the Stasi, you know, we know the Stasi, like how they spy on a domestic population, but little they know that Stasi has a foreign intelligence. Was Eastern German intelligence agency was more successful and even better than equivalent such as the CIA. In this podcast today, we'll look how the Stasi used secrecy and social engineering to collect intelligence and infiltrate the cabinet of Western Germany Chancellor and using him as a puppet to make a decision in favor of the Warsaw Pact countries. Without doubt, Vladimir Putin, you know that name, was the somebody who was a quantum intelligence operative from KGB and collaborated with the Misha and the Stasi International Intelligence Sections. And that being said, ladies and gentlemen, ask yourself how the Stasi leader drove all intelligence agencies insane. He was the mastermind behind the activities. Although <clears throat> he was oblivious that the Berlin Wall was being built. The Israel tabloid Jerusalem Post referred to him as the best espionage chief in the world. Best espionage chief in the world. In the West, he was labeled the man without face for a very, very long time. Until 1979. Western intelligence services had no idea who their main foe looked like who was bothering them and asking their questions. During his tour to Sweden, which was filmed on the tape by a local news organization, he paid a visit to the grave of Kurt Tuchkowski, a prominent German satirist who committed himself after believing Hitler had won the war. Then the weekly Spiegel, Western Germany magazine, immediately published Wolf's photograph. His name is Wolf. Wolf was a head of foreign counterintelligence section of the Eastern Germany intelligence agency called Stasi. Now, let's go dig deep into this and let's go discover who is the man without face. 
His name is Wolf Misha Marcus. Marcus was born on January 19, 1923 in Weimar, Germany. His childhood was spent in Stuttgart. Father Friedrich was a doctor as well as a writer. His mother, Elsa Wolf, was a teacher. The Wolves were compelled to leave Germany in 1933. And as you know why, because Germany has a new chancellor. His name was Adolf Hitler. Ten years after Marcus was born, because being a Jew and a member of the German Communist Party was not ideal combination. So the family lived in France and since them before they relocating to Soviet Union in 1934. Marcus attended elite Moscow school and received Soviet papers at the age of 13 in 1936. Then he studied in Moscow Aviation Institute in Aeronautical Studies in 1940 before joining the Comintern in 1942. When he was transported to Bashkortostan region and trained for espionage activities behind enemy lines at the school. After getting entirely russified, his moniker became Misha. The nickname remained with him for the rest of his life. From 1943 to 1945, after the fall of Komiten, he worked on the radio in the Moscow on the German People Channel. After returning to Germany, yeah, well, he began to work for the Secret Service after the Second World War. Straight away, he's been put into that role. In 1945, he was one of the first Germans to return from the Second World War to the Soviet sector of Germany. He did so under the alias Michael Storm. And, as usually the case it is, he worked as a journalist from Radio Berlin in Berlin. He discussed a number of subjects, including the Nuremberg trials, and he despised Nazism and wished that such tragedies will never happen again. Then what happened? He returned to Moscow in 1949 and served as at the East German Embassy first consul there until 1951. Wolf was afterwards questioned about how he remained anonymous and faceless for so long, but he remarked that this was just a proof of the stupidity of the Western agencies, because he never concealed and always sat on a platform during May parades dressed as a commander. He further stated that it is not his fault, nor his credit, that he was never discovered. Well, it takes a little bit more than that, just that. You have the training as a counterintelligence officer to conceal your identity. From no prior espionage experience to becoming the greatest secret spy ever. Marcus Wolf began his career as a journalist after living in the Soviet Union and Switzerland for several years. He worked as a special reporter for the major war criminals trials at Nuremberg. A gentleman called Walter Ulbricht brought him to his office in 1952 and appointed him as the head of the intelligence services, which had only recently begun to be built. Wolf, then 29, understood nothing about the espionage other from his study at Kushnareko. He announced his resignation in 1987, so he resigned two years before the belly wall fell down. He claims that he disagreed with the East German political directions, that it was time for him to retire and focus on writing, and that he had conflicts with his supervisor, Minister Milke. Milke, like a many old communists, was puritanical and reprimanded Wolf for his very liberal love life. Wolf also observed at the time that finding someone who could survive such a scenario for so long would be difficult. While saying the West Germany Chancellor, he accidentally knocked him down. The political rise and collapse of West Germany Chancellor Willy Brandt acted as a reminder of his time working for the Stasi. I want you to remember this name, Willy Brandt. He was a chancellor of the Western Germany, and Stasi made it possible to have the man who was whispering to German, Western German chancellor in a ear. In particular, in 1972, the CDU attempted to depose then Chancellor Brandt by proposing that Bundestag vote against him. The Social Liberal Alliance held a narrow majority, and every vote affected the outcome of the election. Then he revealed that the Wolf was also involved in the case. In other words, Brandt eventually won a confidence vote with a two-vote majority, and one of those votes came from Julius Steiner, who had been bribed 50,000 Deutschmarks by the Stasi to support Brandt, whose ongoing control suited the Easterns. 
Chancellor Brandt, however, was forced to resign two years later as a result of his assistant, Gunter Guillaume, a clandestine Stasi spy. In 1990, 16 years, years after his departure, Wolf addressed him an apology letter in which he expressed his deep regret for the conduct that he led to his resignation. I want you to understand one thing. People are the key to espionage. People. Stasi was always being observed as a, some, you know, evil agency and people, Western society portrayed, even to us back in my times when I was w w living and working in communist Yugoslavia, as a very, very bad and evil agency. However, every country intelligence agency is there to protect national security and of course to know more about the enemies foreign or domestic that's the reason why military doesn't do nothing internally they are there to protect the borders from foreign enemies that's the reason why I have a police and secret intelligence agencies and list goes on as i mentioned at the beginning people are the key to espionage people not technology not the satellites people in my practice and when I was working in intelligence services, I was always liaising with the people. Yeah, the documents can be typed on a then typewriting machine, then computers, and you know you can observe this information in, in you know by watching, by hearing. But somebody needs to confirm, and usually the confirmation comes from the person. In an interview, Marcus the Wolf stated that he has always preferred agents, and why is that? He says that it's difficult to generalize about big service without with a history of noteworthy failures and accomplishments. He said, I feel that CIA places too much emphasis on the technical aspects of espionage because they assume that sophisticated technology will ensure their success. In contrast, they undervalue human espionage. But I always supported agents and they war. I say that the human aspects, no military strength, might be used to destroy terrorism. Did you hear what I say? Human aspect, not military strength, might be used to destroy terrorism. The army primarily kills people, he stated at the time. His admission, which he wrote about in one of the, his books, that he had no idea the Berlin Wall would be built, stunned everyone. The guy working in Stasi I doesn't know. That's how powerful and strong organization was. Second in charge in Stasi doesn't know the Berlin Wall has been built. He says, I realized that the whole thing seems ridiculous, but I honestly had no idea our people were starting to build a wall. It was a big problem for us since the spies had no difficulties going between different parts of Berlin until that moment. But as the wall rose, it got increasingly difficult. He said, I asked the interior minister how the head of intelligence services could have been kept in dark about such a serious incident. He said, we eventually succeeded although it was more difficult than before the Berlin Wall was created, he noted at the time. So the second in charge of the Stasi, he doesn't know that his boss Milke is a part of building Berlin Wall. And the problem was to how to gonna, spies gonna go from east to west and left to right. Eventually he succeeded. He succeeded because again, he was a somebody who said that the human factor is very important. People are important for espionage, not technical and mechanical means. As I mentioned in my monograph, the corporate informant, a whistleblower management plane, people are those one who bring this information. Marcus Wolf, he was a team chief of Stasi main reconnaissance division called HVA. His HVA department made substantial contribution to Stasi national and international success. At its peak, the HVA employed 4,000 permanent staff members, accounting for just around 5% of all Stasi workers. They say that Stasi at the end of the 1989 has almost 96,000 people working full time, which is a lot. It's a lot. And they had uh, about 1.8 million. Uh, 1.8 million informants, which is just, just the, the, the numbers are staggering, right? But his department has only 4,000 people, 5% of entire Stasi manpower. Other Stasi workers looked up to them since they had access to possibility for worldwide travel and advanced study. As a result, the HVR had unparalleled effectiveness. Marcus Wolf, 
the team's leader and his group, which focused mostly on West Germany, both contributed to the team's success. And in those days, when you send somebody in the West, you need to know how to control them. And he done this so very well. Despite having only 4,000 members compared to the Stasi, 100,000 strong, this organization attracted the most attention from the Western media. The HVR was successful partly because it had access to West German intelligence circles, but it was also successful because Western intelligence services were never able to pry into the HVA ranks. How good is that? How good is that? That you have there somebody who has all this money, support from different countries on the West, Americans, the British, the French, the Spains, NATO countries. But then your opposition, it's a Stasi living in East Germany where there's no money, there's nothing there, right? They had the all access to you, but you don't have access to them. Wolf had a reputation to maintain. Wolf's inability to be physically identified by the West for even 25 years demonstrate how the HVA's exceptional security. Wolf becomes known as the man without face, due to legend that arose as a result of his lack of information. As a result, the HVA have was the most distinguished division of the Stasi for two reasons. The hiring requirements were extremely stringent. If HVA official wanted to work abroad, they had to be completely trustworthy first. Second, the HVR growing mission included technological and scientific espionage. Only knowledgeable officials could com comprehend or assess the value of information in this environment. The primary source of candidates was the Free German Youth Movement. Free German Youth Movement. It was critical that he recruits had not contact with any relatives in the West. As the task became increasingly difficult, an increasing number of recruits came from the families of the high-ranking party officials. As an added assurance of loyalty, salaries in HVR were higher than those in the Stasi internal security branches. Given that there was not a single instance of desertion in HVA, the effectiveness of those security measure, measures has been shown. I want you to understand something very, very important. That the days when I was working in intelligence and I was being introduced and baptized into the intelligence services then in communist Yugoslavia, there was always being given emphasis on security measures. What are you saying? Where are you going? Who are you talking? How are you behaving? Don't be on public places. Don't let nobody take a picture of you. And the list goes on. HVA and the Wolf, they proved that effectiveness. None of the agents was ever being caught, never being prosecuted. And most importantly, nobody ever crossed it to the Western intelligence agencies. In other hand, KGB has a list of people who escaped to the West. And as I say, it doesn't matter what you do, how you do, once when you decide to desert or leave your position, you need to think about people who stay behind you. And that where the communist intelligence agencies very good. You can travel abroad, but your wife, your kids, your mom, your dad stays here with us. Wolf was a very successful manager of the counterintelligence services of the Stasi, particularly on the western side of the Berlin. Let's talk about HVA organization and their departments. The Wolf stated that the department I dealt with the main target, which was West Germany Chancellor, his staff and important ministries. The department number two that worked with the major political parties, labor organization and the church was responsible for the brain's resignation in the Guilam incident. With the exception of the United States and uh, Mexico, Department 3 was supposed to encompass the rest of the world. But in practic practice, it only included a small number of countries where Eastern Germany had embassies. You need to know that Eastern Germany was not being recognized by the world, so very few countries had uh, the embassies. Department 4 focused on military espionage. The counterintelligence services in command of the attacks, Department 9, carried out many infiltrations into West Germany intelligence 
institutions. By the end of 1970s, the HVR research and technology efforts had surpassed those of the KGB through the Eastern Bloc. Can I just bring this something to your attention? Eastern Germany wasn't recognized worldwide, has a few embassies, but yet do you understand how dedicated they were to their job, that they surpassed those of KGB to the Eastern Bloc? Wolf himself stated that other Russia packed countries, intelligence services do not gather information on science and technology to the same extent as HVA. HVA's organization structure is another indicator of the importance they placed on science and what else? Technology. In 1996, Department 10 was established within HVA. On both sides of the Iron Curtain, he was entrusted with propagating false information, which was regarded as an essential component of alternative warfare. 1996, Wolf's Department 10 comrades further up the onslaught against West Germany. They attempted to solve discord and mistrust between West Germany and its allies by disclosing that West Germany top officials were former Nazis and war criminals. Well, of course, there was some Nazis and war criminals in Western German government. But there's something very interesting in what he developed, something was called the Romeo Spies. Wolf mentioned that in Cold War era, specifically that conditions were extremely tight and the situation peaked in 1962 during the Cuban crisis, when war, mm, war nearly broke out. We have that situation right now. Tensions escalated during the Vietnam War, he added, because Americans generals frequently attempted to unleash an atomic bomb on Vietnam on occasion. Yeah, well, they, they wanted, really, they, there's a lot of documents there. Marcus Wolf's go-to approach, according to Reveal Secret, was to recruit attractive secret agents, both male and female, into the adversary official ranks. And as I say at the beginning of this podcast, I want you to grasp this concept, social engineering. It's very important to understand that informants has been approached before they become informants. Do you already have the on them I've created the, something that's called a, a target, personal interest to become the target. And then you create a profile of somebody and then you approach according to your research and your background checks and your due diligence and what they do have, which is very attractive and you can approach them. But Stasi and HVA, particularly the Marcus Wolf, they done this to such an extent because it was the cheapest, most effective, and something what was being given 24-7 access to information. So he was recruiting attractive secret agents, male and female, and of course. And I understand that James Bond style espionage stories are popular, but they only represent one component of intelligence work, because all sorts of intelligence work rely on personal interactions. Romeo situation occur frequently. The problem is that a great agent might be destroyed by a great love, which is something you don't want to happen. No, you don't want to happen. I said this to one of my podcasters, I'm going to share this with you. I had a couple of my colleagues who were being stationed across the globe, but they will find them on the other side of the globe in different parts of their body. And the last thing what they know about my colleague was that they were interacting with some beautiful very seductive woman. Marcus Wolf in 50s, 60s and 70s brought this to the such a great level. In one interview, Marcus stated that the women offer some of the most important knowledge to his service in a number of ways. Because the majority of ministerial or military secretaries are the women. Knowledge that most civil employees or other government officials lack passes via their hands. He stated that they were our most trusted top secret confidence. Renate Lutz, a secretary of director of the Ministry of Defense, Department of Social Affairs, and her husband Lothar and Jürgen Wiegel were arrested in June 1976 on suspicion of transmitting confidential material to the Stasi. 
startling born with yet another security controversy. You know, it's not just that they prime minister or the chancellor they call in Germany, but as well the ministers as well are being compromised. How is it possible that the agency which everybody claims is so evil, they have no money, they, they have nothing in their possession, can infiltrate such a high position, ministerial offices and you know the chancellor office, except if they're done utilizing social engineering. According to the investigation, the trio espionage was the worst in the West Germany history. And their arrest resulted in detention of 16 more East German spies. Detention. By the late 1970s, the renowned Romeo method has been uncovered, in which an uncovered and undercover agent seeks to seduce a lady, typically a Secret Service employee, who has access to classified material. However, because more males were working in secret organization in the West, the tactic was less successful than expected. The East Germany and Yugoslavia, as you know, maybe don't, did not cooperate. Yugoslavia was separated themselves from the Russia during the Stalin, but then when the Khrushchev comes and, you know, and, and uh, Brezhnev, everybody else, yeah, we'll start talking together. However, East German Yugoslavia service never cooperate together, except in one thing, Carlos the Jackal. You know this guy? I'm gonna put you a link on that video, done it. He was a always visitor to East Germany and Yugoslavia. In interviews, he, Wolf indicates that to the best of his knowledge, at the time he served the Stasi, none of from his service worker with Yugoslavia service personnel, despite the influence of the Soviet KGB service initially being strong and having their own people in its service. The Stasi, in his opinion, has been independent and independent service since 1960. That had great deal of cooperation with the Soviet older brother and Vladimir Putin, who was the liaison officer, all with the aim of fighting against the enemies of the time. Vladimir Putin, Russia current president, once claimed that the meeting never took place because he was serving in Dresden, East Germany at the time. Think about this. When he retired in 1960, Wolf, he left the Stasi and he began to write the books. Marcus Wolf literally worked, or more specifically, his writing as a writer was notable because his forums and promotions were consistently well attended. He added that the circumstances were particularly unpleasant, given how negatively people viewed East Germany at the time. And we understand why was that, because people know that just a partial story about Stasi spying on their citizens. Years of writing and judging books, that was a his sort of type of retirement. He stated in his memories that after Germany was reunited, he turned down the CIA offer to reveal KGB agent in exchange for a green card and happy life in America. Why would somebody do this? After discovering that a warrant had been issued for his arrest, he escaped to Austria and then in Russia. But a year later, he turned himself into the German authorities. On that particular occasion, he was detained for a short period of time before being released. In the 1990s, he was tried for high treason, corruption, serious assault, kidnapping. And then in 1993, he was sentenced to six years in prison. But in 1995, he was declared innocent. At the second trial in 1997, he was sentenced to two years in prison for his role in four murders. However, this punishment was eventually reduced to two years with suspended sentence. Marcus better known Misha Wolf, also known as the man without face, died at the age of 83 on November 9, 2006, the anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. He left behind his wife, 11 grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. He was laid to rest alongside his own brother and then famed East German filmmaker Konrad Wolf in the section of Berlin Central Cemetery reserved for leftists. So the cemetery has that section next to his brother, Conrad Wolf, in the section of Berlin Central Cemetery. That's the story of the man without face. For decades, 
CIA, MI6, another agency, tried to pinpoint the man who was leading counterintelligence agent side of the Stasi and I never discover. Thank you for watching Life the Battlefield. Feel free to subscribe, share, like, and comment. And let me know what do you think about Man Without Face, Misha, the man who ran the Stasi.